Loss of Breath by Edgar Allan Poe Epimelia Yorgos Pitropoyanakis The most notorious ill fortune must in the end yield to the untiring courage of philosophy as the most stubborn city to the ceaseless vigilance of an enemy. Shalmaneser, as we have it in the holy writings, lay three years before Samaria, yet it fell. Sardanapalus, see Diodorus, maintained himself seven in Nineveh, but to no purpose. Troy expired at the close of the second lustrum, and Azoth, as Aristeus declares upon his honour as a gentleman, opened her gates to Samaticus after having barred them for the fifth part of a century. "'Thou wretch! Thou vixen! Thou shrew!' said I to my wife on the morning after our wedding. "'Thou witch! Thou hag! Thou whippersnapper! Thou sink of iniquity! Thou fiery-faced quintessence of all that is abominable! Thou! Thou!' here standing upon tiptoe, seizing her by the throat, and placing my mouth close to her ear. I was preparing to launch forth a new and more decided epithet of opprobrium, which should not fail, if ejaculated, to convince her of her insignificance, when to my extreme horror and astonishment I discovered that I had lost my breath. The phrase is, I am out of breath, I have lost my breath, and so on, are often enough repeated in common conversation. But it had never occurred to me that the terrible accident of which I speak could, bona fide, and actually happen. Imagine, that is, if you have a fanciful turn, imagine, I say, my wonder— my consternation, my despair. There is a good genius, however, which has never entirely deserted me. In my most ungovernable moods I still retain a sense of propriety, et le chemin des passions me conduit, as Lord Edouard in the Julie says it did him, à la philosophie véritable. Although I could not at first precisely ascertain to what degree the occurrence had affected me, I determined at all events to conceal the matter from my wife until further experience should discover to me the extent of this my unheard-of calamity. Altering my countenance, therefore, in a moment, from its bepuffed and distorted appearance, to an expression of arch and coquettish benignity. I gave my lady a pat on the one cheek and a kiss on the other, and without saying one syllable, furies I could not, left her astonished at my drollery as I pirouetted out of the room in a pas de zephyr. Behold me, then, safely ensconced in my private boudoir, a fearful instance of the ill consequences attending upon irascibility, alive with the qualifications of the dead, dead with the propensities of the living, an anomaly on the face of the earth, being very calm, yet breathless. Yes, breathless, I am serious in asserting that my breath was entirely gone. I could not have stirred with it a feather if my life had been at issue, or sullied even the delicacy of a mirror. Hard fate! Yet there was some alleviation to the first overwhelming paroxysm of my sorrow. I found, upon trial— that the powers of utterance which, upon my inability to proceed in the conversations with my wife, 
I then concluded to be totally destroyed, were in fact only partially impeded, and I discovered that had I at that interesting crisis dropped my voice to a singularly deep guttural, I might still have continued to her the communication of my sentiments. This pitch of voice, the guttural, depending, I find, not upon the current of the breath, but upon a certain spasmodic action of the muscles of the throat. Throwing myself upon a chair, I remained for some time absorbed in meditation. My reflections, be sure, were of no consolatory kind. A thousand vague and lacrimatory fancies took possession of my soul, and even the idea of suicide flitted across my brain. But it is a trait in the perversity of human nature to reject the obvious and the ready for the far distant and equivocal. Thus I shuddered at self-murder as the most decided of atrocities, while the tabby-cat purred strenuously upon the rug, and the very water-dog wheezed assiduously under the table each taking to itself much merit for the strength of its lungs, and all obviously done in derision of my own pulmonary incapacity. Oppressed with a tumult of vague hopes and fears, I at length heard the footsteps of my wife descending the staircase. Being now assured of her absence, I returned with a palpitating heart to the scene of my disaster. Carefully locking the door on the inside, I commenced a vigorous search. It was possible, I thought, that concealed in some obscure corner, or lurking in some closet or drawer, might be found the lost object of my inquiry. It might have been a vapory, it might even have a tangible form. Most philosophers, upon many points of philosophy, are still very unphilosophical. William Godwin, however, says in his Mandeville that invisible things are the only realities, and this, all will allow, is a case in point. I would have the judicious reader pause before accusing such asseverations of an undue quantum of absurdity. Anaxagoras, it will be remembered, maintained that snow is black, and this I have since found to be the case. Long and earnestly did I continue the investigation, but the contemptible reward of my industry and perseverance proved to be only a set of false teeth, two pair of hips, an eye, and a bundle of billet doux from Mr. Windenough to my wife. I might as well here observe that this confirmation of my lady's partiality for Mr. Windenough occasioned me little uneasiness. That Mrs. Lackabreath should admire anything so dissimilar to myself was a natural and necessary evil. I am, it is well known, of a robust and corpulent appearance, and at the same time somewhat diminutive in stature. What wonder, then, that the lath-like tenuity of my acquaintance, and his altitude, which has grown into a proverb, should have met with all due estimation in the eyes of Mrs. Lackabreath. But to return. My exertions, as I have before said, proved fruitless. Closet after closet, drawer after drawer, Corner after corner was scrutinized to no purpose. At one time, however, I thought myself sure of my prize, having in rummaging a dressing-case accidentally demolished a bottle of Grand Jean's oil of archangels, which, as an agreeable perfume, I here take the liberty of recommending. With a heavy heart I returned to my boudoir, 
there to ponder upon some method of eluding my wife's penetration, until I could make arrangements prior to my leaving the country, for this I had already made up my mind to do. In a foreign climate, being unknown, I might, with some probability of success, endeavour to conceal my unhappy calamity, a calamity calculated even more than beggary, to estrange the affections of the multitude, and to draw down upon the wretch the well-merited indignation of the virtuous and the happy. I was not long in hesitation. Being naturally quick, I committed to memory the entire tragedy of Metamora. I had the good fortune to recollect that in the accentuation of this drama, or at least of such portion of it as is allotted to the hero, the tones of voice in which I found myself deficient were altogether unnecessary, and that the deep guttural was expected to reign monotonously throughout. I practised for some time by the borders of a well-frequented marsh. Herein, however, having no reference to a similar proceeding of Demosthenes, but from a design peculiarly and conscientiously my own. Thus armed at all points, I determined to make my wife believe that I was suddenly smitten with a passion for the stage. In this I succeeded to a miracle, and to every question or suggestion found myself at liberty to reply in my most frog-like and sepulchral tones— with some passage from the tragedy, any portion of which, as I soon took great pleasure in observing, would apply equally well to any particular subject. It is not to be supposed, however, that in the delivery of such passages I was found at all deficient in the looking a squint, the showing my teeth, the working my knees, the shuffling my feet, or in any of those unmentionable graces which are now justly considered the characteristics of a popular performer. To be sure, they spoke of confining me in a straitjacket, but, good God, they never suspected me of having lost. Having at length put my affairs in order, I took my seat very early one morning in the mail stage, giving it to be understood among my acquaintances that business of the last importance required my immediate personal attendance. The coach was crammed to repletion, but in the uncertain twilight the features of my companions could not be distinguished. Without making any effectual resistance, I suffered myself to be placed between two gentlemen of colossal dimensions, while a third— of a size larger, requesting pardon for the liberty he was about to take, threw himself upon my body at full length, and falling asleep in an instant, drowned all my guttural ejaculations for relief in a snore which would have put to blush the roarings of the bull of Falaris. Happily, the state of my respiratory faculties rendered suffocation an accident entirely out of the question. As, however, the day broke more distinctly in our approach to the outskirts of the city, my tormentor arose, and adjusting his shirt-collar, thanked me in a very friendly manner for my civility. Seeing that I remained motionless, all my limbs were dislocated, and my head twisted to one side. His apprehensions began to be excited, and arousing the rest of the passengers, he communicated in a very decided manner his opinion that a dead man had been palmed upon them during the night for a living and responsible fellow-traveller, here giving me a thump on the right eye by way of demonstrating the truth of his suggestion. Hereupon all, one after another, and there were nine in the company, believed it their duty to 
pull me by the ear. A young practising physician, too, having applied a pocket mirror to my mouth, and found me without breath, the assertion of my persecutor was pronounced a true bill, and the whole party expressed a determination to endure tamely no such impositions for the future, and to proceed no further with any such carcasses for the present. I was here, accordingly, thrown out at the sign of the crow, by which tavern the coach happened to be passing, without meeting with any further accident than the breaking of both my arms under the left-hand wheel of the vehicle. I must, besides, do the driver the justice to state that he did not forget to throw after me the largest of my trunks, which unfortunately, falling on my head, fractured my skull in a manner at once interesting and extraordinary. The landlord of the Crow, who is a hospitable man, finding that my trunk contained sufficient to indemnify him for any little trouble he might take in my behalf, sent forthwith for a surgeon of his acquaintance, and delivered me to his care with a bill and receipt for ten dollars. The purchaser took me to his apartments and commenced operations immediately. Having cut off my ears, however, he discovered signs of animation. He now rang the bell and sent for a neighbouring apothecary, with whom to consult in the emergency. In case of his suspicions with regard to my existence proving ultimately correct, he, in the meantime, made an incision in my stomach and removed several of my viscera for private dissection. The apothecary had an idea that I was actually dead. This idea I endeavoured to confute, kicking and plunging with all my might, and making the most furious contortions. For the operations of the surgeon had, in a measure, restored me to the possession of my faculties. All, however, was attributed to the effects of a new galvanic battery, wherewith the apothecary, who was really a man of information, performed several curious experiments, in which— from my personal share in their fulfilment, I could not help feeling deeply interested. It was a source of mortification to me, nevertheless, that although I made several attempts at conversation, my powers of speech were so entirely in abeyance that I could not even open my mouth, much less than make reply to some ingenious but fanciful theories of which— under other circumstances, my minute acquaintance with the Hippocratian pathology would have afforded me a ready confutation. Not being able to arrive at a conclusion, the practitioners remanded me for further examination. I was taken up into a garret, and the surgeon's lady, having accommodated me with drawers and stockings, the surgeon himself fastened my hands and tied up my jaws with a pocket-handkerchief, then bolted the door on the outside as he hurried to his dinner, leaving me to silence and to meditation. I now discovered, to my extreme delight, that I could have spoken had not my mouth been tied up by the pocket-handkerchief. Consoling myself with this reflection, I was mentally repeating some passages of the omnipresence of the deity, as is my custom before resigning myself to sleep, when two cats of a greedy and vituperative turn entered at a hole in the wall, leapt up with a flourish a la Catalani, and alighting opposite one another on my visage, betook themselves to indecorous contention for the paltry consideration of my nose. But, as the loss of his ears proved the means of elevating to the throne of Cyrus 
the Magian, or Midya Gush of Persia, and as the cutting off his nose gave Zopirus possession of Babylon, so the loss of a few ounces of my countenance proved the salvation of my body. Aroused by the pain, and burning with indignation, I burst at a single effort the fastenings and the bandage. Stalking across the room, I cast a glance of contempt at the belligerents, and throwing open the sash, to their extreme horror and disappointment, precipitated myself very dexterously from the window. A male robber, to whom I bore a singular resemblance, was at this moment passing from the city jail to the scaffold erected for his execution in the suburbs. His extreme infirmity and long-continued ill health had obtained him the privilege of remaining unmanacled, and habited in his gallows costume, one very similar to my own, he lay at full length in the bottom of the hangman's cart, which happened to be under the windows of the surgeon at the moment of my precipitation, without any other guard than the driver, who was asleep, and two recruits of the Sixth Infantry who were drunk. As luck would have it, I alit upon my feet within the vehicle. The male robber, who was an acute fellow, perceived his opportunity. Leaping up immediately, he bolted out behind, and turning down an alley, was out of sight in the twinkling of an eye. The recruits, aroused by the bustle, could not exactly comprehend the merits of the transaction. Seeing, however, a man, the precise counterpart of the felon, standing upright in the cart before their eyes, they were of opinion that the rascal male robber was after making his escape. Uh, so they expressed themselves, and having communicated this opinion to one another, they took each a dram, and then knocked me down with the butt-ends of their muskets. It was not long before we arrived at the place of destination. Of course, nothing could be said in my defence— Hanging was my inevitable fate. I resigned myself thereto with a feeling half stupid, half acrimonious. Being little of a cynic, I had all the sentiments of a dog. The hangman, however, adjusted the noose about my neck. The drop fell. I forbear to depict my sensations upon the gallows, although here, undoubtedly, I could speak to the point, and it is a topic upon which nothing has been well said. In fact, to write upon such a theme it is necessary to have been hanged. Every author should confine himself to matters of experience. Thus Mark Antony composed a treatise upon getting drunk. I may just mention, however, the die I did not. My body was, but I had no breath to be suspended, and but for the knot under my left ear, which had the feel of a military stock, I dare say that I should have experienced very little inconvenience. As for the jerk given to my neck upon the falling of the drop, it merely proved a corrective to the twist afforded me by the fat gentleman in the coach. For good reason, however, I did my best to give the crowd the worth of their trouble. My convulsions were said to have been extraordinary. My spasms it would have been difficult to beat. The populace encored. Several gentlemen swooned and a multitude of ladies were carried home in hysterics. Pinksit availed himself of the opportunity to retouch from a sketch taken upon the spot his admirable painting of the Masias flayed alive. When I had afforded sufficient amusement, it was thought proper to remove my body from the gallows, 
this the more especially as the real culprit had in the meantime been retaken and recognised, a fact which I was so unlucky as not to know. Much sympathy was, of course, exercised in my behalf, and as no one made claim to my corpse, it was ordered that I should be interred in a public vault. Here, after due interval, I was deposited. The sexton departed, and I was left alone. A line of Marston's malcontent, Death's a good fellow, and keeps open house, struck me at that moment as a palpable lie. I knocked off, however, the lid of my coffin, and stepped out. The place was dreadfully dreary and damp, and I became troubled with ennui. By way of amusement, I felt my way among the numerous coffins ranged in order around. I lifted them down one by one, and, breaking open their lids, busied myself in speculations about the mortality within. This, I soliloquized, tumbling over a carcass, puffy, bloated, and rotund, this has been no doubt in every sense of the word an unhappy, an unfortunate man. It has been his terrible lot not to walk, but to waddle, to pass through life not like a human being, but like an elephant, not like a man, but like a rhinoceros. His attempts at getting on have been mere abortions, and his circumgyratory proceedings a palpable failure. Taking a step forward, it has been his misfortune to take two towards the right and three towards the left. His studies have been confined to the poetry of Crab. He can have no idea of a pirouette. To him, a pas de papillon has been an abstract conception. He has never ascended the summit of a hill. He has never viewed from any steeple the glories of a metropolis. Heat has been his mortal enemy. In the dog days, his days have been the days of a dog. Therein he has dreamed of flames and suffocation, of mountains upon mountains, of Pelion upon Ossa. He was short of breath. To say all in a word, he was short of breath. He thought it extravagant to play upon wind instruments. He was the invention of self-moving fans, wind sails, and ventilators. He patronized Dupont, the bellows-maker, and died miserably in attempting to smoke a cigar. His was a case in which I feel a deep interest, a lot in which I sincerely sympathize. But here, said I, here, and I dragged spitefully from my receptacle a gaunt, tall and peculiar-looking form, whose remarkable appearance struck me with a sense of unwelcome familiarity, here is a wretch entitled to no earthly commiseration. Thus saying, in order to obtain a more distinct view of my subject, I applied my thumb and forefinger to its nose, and causing it to assume a sitting position on the ground, held it thus at the length of my arms, while I continued my soliloquy. Entitled... I repeated, to no earthly commiserations. Who, indeed, would think of compassionating a shadow? Besides, has he not had his full share of the blessings of mortality? He was the originator of tall monuments, shot towers, lightning rods, Lombardy poplars, his treatise upon shades and shadows has immortalized him. 
He edited with distinguished ability the best edition of South on the Bones. He went early to college and studied pneumatics. He then came home, talked eternally, and played upon the French horn. He patronized the bagpipes. Captain Barclay, who walked against time, would not walk against him. Wyndham and Allbreath were his favorite writers. His favorite artist, Fizz. He died gloriously while inhaling gas, levique flatu corrupitor, like the fama pudicity in Hieronymus. He was indisputably a... How can you? How can you? interrupted the object of my animadversions, gasping for breath and tearing off with a desperate exertion the bandage around its jaws. How can you, Mr. Lack of Breath, be so infernally cruel as to pinch me in that manner by the nose? Did you not see how they had fastened up my mouth? And you must know, if you know anything— how vast a superfluity of breath I have to dispose of! If you do not know, however, sit down and you shall see. In my situation it really is a great relief to be able to open one's mouth, uh, to be able to expatiate, to be able to communicate with a person like yourself— who do not think yourself called upon at every period to interrupt the thread of a gentleman's discourse. Interruptions are annoying, and should undoubtedly be abolished. Don't you think so? No reply, I beg you. One person is enough to be speaking at a time. I shall be done by and by, and then you may begin. How the devil, sir, did you get into this place? Uh, not a word, I beseech you. Been here some time myself. Terrible accident. Heard of it, I suppose. Awful calamity. Walking under your window some short while ago, about the time you were stage-struck. Horrible occurrence. Heard of catching one's breath, eh? Uh, hold your tongue, I tell you. I caught somebody else's. Always had too much of my own. Met Blab in the corner of the street. Wouldn't give me a chance for a word. Couldn't get in a syllable edgeways. Attacked, consequently, with epilepsy. Blab made his escape. Damn all fools! They took me up for dead and put me in this place. Pretty doings, all of them. "'Heard all you said about me. "'Every word a lie. "'Horrible. "'Wonderful. "'Outrageous. "'Hideous. "'Incomprehensible. "'Etc., etc., etc., etc. "'It is impossible to conceive my astonishment "'at so unexpected a discourse, "'or the joy with which I became gradually convinced "'that the breath so fortunately caught by the gentleman whom I soon recognized as my neighbor, Windenough, was in fact the identical expiration mislaid by myself in the conversation with my wife. Time, place, and circumstance rendered it a matter beyond question. I did not, however, immediately release my hold upon Mr. Windenough's proboscis, not at least during the long period in which the inventor of Lombardy poplars continued to favour me with his explanations. In this respect I was actuated by that habitual prudence which has ever been my predominating trait. I reflected that many difficulties might still lie in the path of my preservation, which only extreme exertion on my part would be able to surmount. Many persons, I considered, are prone to estimate commodities in their possession, however valueless to the then proprietor, however troublesome or distressing 
in direct ratio with the advantages to be derived by others from their attainment or by themselves from their abandonment. Might not this be the case with Mr. Windenough? In displaying anxiety for the breath of which he was at present so willing to get rid, might I not lay myself open to the exactions of his avarice? There are scoundrels in this world, I remembered with a sigh, who will not scruple to take unfair opportunities with even a next-door neighbour. And, this remark is from Epictetus, it is precisely at that time when men are most anxious to throw off the burden of their own calamities that they feel the least desirous of relieving them to others. Upon consideration similar to these, and still retaining my grasp upon the nose of Mr. Windenough, I accordingly thought proper to model my reply. Monster! I began, in a tone of the deepest indignation. Monster! And double-winded idiot! Dost thou— whom for thine iniquities it has pleased heaven to a curse with a twofold respiration? Dost thou, I say, presume to address me in the familiar language of an old acquaintance? I lie, forsooth, and hold my tongue, to be sure. Pretty conversation, indeed, to a gentleman with a single breath. All this, too, when I have it in my power to relieve the calamity under which thou dost so justly suffer, to curtail the superfluousness of thine unhappy respiration. Like Brutus, I paused for a reply, with which, like a tornado, Mr. Windenough immediately overwhelmed me. Protestation followed upon protestation, and apology upon apology. There were no terms with which he was unwilling to comply, and there were none of which I failed to take the fullest advantage. Preliminaries being at length arranged, my acquaintance delivered me the respiration, for which, having carefully examined it, I gave him afterwards a receipt. I am aware that by many I shall be held to blame for speaking, in a manner so cursory, of a transaction so impalpable. It will be thought that I should have entered more minutely into the details of an occurrence by which, and this is very true, much more light might be thrown upon a highly interesting branch of physical philosophy. To all this I am sorry that I cannot reply. A hint is the only answer which I am permitted to make. There were circumstances, but I think it much safer upon consideration to say as little as possible about an affair so delicate, so delicate, I repeat, and at the time involving the interests of a third party, whose sulphurous resentment I have not the least desire at this moment of incurring. We were not long, after this necessary arrangement, in effecting an escape from the dungeons of the sepulchre. The united strength of our resuscitated voices was soon sufficiently apparent. Scissors, the Whig editor, republished a treatise upon the nature and origin of subterranean noises. A reply, rejoinder, confutation, and justification followed in the columns of a democratic gazette. It was not until the opening of the vault to decide the controversy that the appearance of Mr. Windenough and myself proved both parties to have been decidedly in the wrong. I cannot conclude these details of some very singular passages in a life at all times sufficiently eventful without again recalling to the attention of the reader the merits of that indiscriminate philosophy 
which is a sure and ready shield against those shafts of calamity which can neither be seen, felt, nor fully understood. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that among the ancient Hebrews it was believed the gates of heaven would be inevitably open to that sinner or saint who, with good lungs and implicit confidence, should vociferate the word, Amen. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that, when a great plague raged at Athens, and every means had been attempted for its removal, Epimenides, as Laertius relates in his second book of that philosopher, advised the erection of a shrine and temple to the proper God. Epimelia Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης. 